So often on the show, we look at one particular aspect of a vegan or a plant-based diet here on the exam room, whether it's losing weight or a specific nutrient or helping reverse heart disease or diabetes. But today on the show, we are going to be taking a much larger look at things. Today, we are going to be taking a step back and looking at the big picture. And by big, I mean the global picture, the true ramifications of your diet and how that has a ripple effect literally around the world. And to help us with this discussion is a gentleman who fits the bill perfectly to talk all about this. You see him right there. He is the author of the best-selling book, The World Peace Diet. He has given more than 4,000 lectures and he has been eating a vegan diet for 40 years now. You you are quite the, uh, the, the gentleman here, sir. Uh, Dr. Will Tuttle, welcome to the exam room. Great. Thank you so much. And Chuck, and thanks everyone for uh, tuning in. It's great to be here. The big picture that you talk about in your book and in your lectures is something that really is fascinating to me. Um, how did this whole thing start? Like what drew you into the idea of eating a vegan diet? Was it one specific thing or did you just wake up one morning and have this epiphany where you did see things from that 20 or 30,000 foot view and it just clicked? Actually, I think for me, it was like with most people, it was a process and it, it took quite a few years. Uh, you know, I was born and raised in a typical family, eating the usual meals. And uh, this was in New England. And basically, uh, when I went away to college, I started to question everything. This was back in the early 1970s, the Vietnam War era and so forth. And part of what I started questioning was just the, the military mindset and the exploitation of people and nature and environmental. And we had the first Earth Day started happening. And also I began to study spirituality more in depth. I was drawn not only to Western spirituality, Christianity, and, but also Eastern and yoga and meditation and Zen. And I decided with my brother to leave home. That was probably the big thing in 1975. That, right after graduating from college, my brother and I decided we would walk to California. And we got as far as Buffalo, actually, after a few months. But then we walked south. We walked all the way to Alabama. And we ended up at a Zen center in Alabama. And on the way, uh, we stopped for a while at what was at the time the largest hippie commune in the world, which was called The Farm in, in Tennessee. And it was there that I really uh, met about 900 people that were basically living a vegan lifestyle, it's about 200 kids that were vegan from birth. Everybody was thriving. They were healthy. And I learned from them about the abuse of animals. I learned from them uh, about the fact that we're growing enough food to feed everyone if people would move to a plant-based way of eating. We wouldn't have to have hunger and starvation, which is really the driving force behind a lot of the conflict and war in the world. So the world peace aspect was uh, impressed on me very early on with compassion for animals and health. And so I became a vegetarian at that point in 1975. And then a few years later, again, doing more research, uh, I, get, I was working on a PhD at Berkeley and I was doing a lot more meditation as well. And so I became a vegan when I learned more about the uh, consequences really of animal agriculture and dairy and egg production to cows and to hens and so forth and that was in 1980 so it's been a, it's been a wonderful journey i have to say i always say the smartest thing i ever did in my life besides marrying my wonderful spouse madeline was going vegan <laughs> well you were certainly well ahead of the curve in um, 1980 i think that uh, every day in the us something uh, to the effect of close to 80 million animals uh, are killed uh, for food um let's talk about the ramifications of that that number when you just pause and you think about that like that is an enormous figure but it doesn't really get talked about. You look at the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, which has claimed so many lives here, but nothing close to one day's worth of animals here just in the U.S. And what are the ramifications of that psychologically from an environmental perspective from so many different uh, you know, viewpoints here? I, I would just think that number is astronomical and has just a huge impact on so many things we're not even thinking about. Well, yeah, it does. And uh, as we said, um, I have in the World Peace Diet, I have really laid that out and it's 13 and a half hours long, which I won't uh, 
as a vegan, I don't like to cause unnecessary <laughs> suffering to sentient beings. So I won't keep everybody here 13 and a half hours. <laughs> but, but basically, uh, you're right. I mean, 80 million land animals, that doesn't include the marine animals, fishes uh, that we're killing, which is way, way beyond that. It's a, uh, we don't even know. I mean, it's about almost 2 trillion, they are estimating uh, worldwide per year. So uh, probably at least a billion in the United States every day, if possible. So uh, we're killing num the numbers of animals that are probably uh, difficult for us to even begin to comprehend. And we're and it's unnecessary. I think that's the main thing to understand. Uh, me and literally millions of people like me, uh, are, I'm an example of someone eating a plant-based diet and I'm as healthy and I'm sure probably a lot healthier than people who are not eating a plant-based diet after 40 years of doing this. So uh, the ramifications environmentally are just the fact that this kind of wastefulness, it takes enormous quantities of land and water and petroleum in order to feed all these animals, to house them, to uh, kill them, to transport them. And that's, it's wasteful. So everyone who studies the world hunger problem, for example, it becomes very obvious very quickly that we're growing enough food every year to feed everyone, probably 10 to 15 billion people, according to most estimates. So we have about 7.8 billion. So there's no reason for one, roughly 1 billion of humanity to be going hungry and starving. But again, if we want to eat animal foods, that's going to be happening. We also have whole armies of workers who have no other job than to stab animals or impregnate them against their will on rape racks, which is what the industry calls this. These are workers that have to abuse animals all day. That's what they're paid for. And these workers have the highest rates of injury, uh, among the highest rates of suicide, drug addiction, alcoholism, spousal abuse, child abuse. They basically go home after work and do terrible things very often to themselves and others because the work they're doing brings out the worst in them. So it's really important, I think, just to be aware of the tremendous suffering that is caused to animals, uh, to hungry people, to workers, to ecosystems, to wildlife, to indigenous people, all who see their habitats being destroyed, their lives being harmed, uh, their, their bodies being abused, especially in the case of the cows and pigs and chickens and fishes and other animals uh, who are used for food. And so the, the, the underlying idea is that these are webs of trauma that radiate into our, our interconnected web of relations in an unending way. And this trauma affects all of us because we're all interconnected. I think that's really the main thing to understand here is the interconnectedness of all of us on this earth. So if we have a situation where we're sowing the seeds of, of violence and, and harm and exploitation to other sentient beings, and anyone who has a dog or a cat or companion animal knows that these animals have interests and that their interests are important to them. So when we're sowing the seeds of harm and abuse to these animals unnecessarily, these other beings, uh, it boomerangs back in all kinds of ways. When we destroy ecosystems, we destroy the quality of water, we deplete water, when we destroy the quality of the air we're breathing, when we uh, erode the soil, when we destroy the oceans, when we disturb the climate, you know, all these things which animal agriculture does more than any other human activity, uh, we see that we're inheriting and basically causing, and then also uh, giving forth really to future generations, a planet that is uh, not healthy. And so the whole idea with being healthy is to see the interconnectedness of these different layers of health. I call them the five layers of health, the five dimensions of health, which are our environmental health, our cultural health, our physical health, which is what we think of usually when we think of being healthy, but also uh, the psychological health that we have and our spiritual health. Those are the five things that are all interconnected and they're all harmed uh, and eroded and relentlessly reduced really by animal agriculture. Animal agriculture attacks uh, these uh, these types of health on all levels. And so the good news underlying all of this is that as we understand this and we move our mind and our body and our life toward a plant-based way of eating, then we dramatically reduce our own physical health, psychological health, spiritual health, and the health of other people in our society, our cultural health, and the health of, of our ecosystems. They're all interconnected because uh, an organic, plant-based way of eating and living requires so much fewer resources 
and is basically not requiring such violence against human beings and animals and ecosystems and against our bodies. I know your listeners uh, and viewers are aware of the fact that eating saturated fat and cholesterol and acidifying and inflammatory animal protein is not good for our physical body. What I really like to talk about in the World Peace Diet, though, is also how it affects us psychologically and emotionally to be eating terror and fear and pain and despair and anxiety and to be causing those things unnecessarily. That, that's something that subconsciously, I think, we're all aware of, but we would rather not think about it, right? We'd rather just pretend that it's not happening. And I think that is a big uh, problem because it makes us live in an unauthentic way. And this inauthenticity allows us to be exploited. And I think we have to realize that if we're not healthy and we're, and we're basically spending lots of money uh, on pharmaceutical drugs and other things that in a certain way we are being exploited. It's time for us to take responsibility for our own health and for the health of our society and the health of our planet. And we can do that by moving to a plant-based way of eating and understanding the interconnectedness of all these different dimensions of health. I want to go back to who it was you were talking about at the beginning of, of your answer there. And that is the unfortunate souls whose job it is to actually slaughter these 75 million animals every single day and the ramifications that come with that the uh, spousal abuse, the depression, I believe you, you even mentioned suicide there. So let's talk, uh, really kind of hammer home this point. In your estimation, say there was a parallel universe and this person, this exact same person was working a different job where they were not slaughtering animals for a living. In your estimation, do you believe that there is a very good chance that they would not be having the, that same type of psychological, emotional trauma going on and ergo the violence then that they're bringing home with them? Yes, I think that's a great question. And thanks for uh, diving a little more deeply into this because it's very well documented that workers in slaughterhouses and, and many factory farm operations and stockyards and so forth develop what is referred to as perpetrator-induced traumatic stress disorder. So it's a traumatic stress disorder that is induced when we as human beings who are naturally empathetic, we all have a natural sense of empathy. When we see a, a, somebody being harmed in front of us, we want to stop that because we know what it is to suffer and we don't like it. We don't want to cause suffering to others. So we have these large industries in place that cannot function without workers who are paid to inflict horrible abuse on these animals. They, the animals don't cooperate. They, they're, they're, they don't want to have their babies stolen. They don't want to be impregnated against their will. They don't want to be killed. They're trying to escape however they can. And so the workers, and I've studied this a lot. I've watched a lot of videos and read accounts and so forth. Workers gradually, day after day, week after week, month after month, they get harder and harder in their hearts. And they become, this one worker said, I you become as sadistic as the corporation itself. That's what he said. You know, you can't get more sadistic than that. I mean, a corporation has no feelings. It's all about the bottom line, period. And so that kind of um, just do whatever it takes to get the job done, that erodes our humanity. And to live in a society where all of us are taking out our wallets and paying for this, we're causing it, right? That's when we vote. The voting booth is our wallets. The ballots are our dollars. If I'm taking out my wallet and paying for meat-dairy products and eggs, I'm paying for people to do this kind of soul-crushing work, this mind-altering uh, violence, and, ca and causing real suffering to them and, of course, to the animals and to their families and to other, others and a whole web of, of damage. So, uh, so it's really important, I think, just to be, again, I'm not blaming anyone. This is just understand we're born into a system. This, we're born into it, kind of thrown in. We're born here. And this has been going on, as I say, in the World Peace Diet for 10,000 years. We've been herding animals and somebody had to do the work. And very often it was the lowest castes in society that had to do that kind of work. And it still is today. It's mostly, it's the worst work. I mean, I've been to these places and you do not want to have these jobs. This is the lowest caste in our society today are the people that have to do this work. And they would rather not, but you know, the, the basic thing is if you don't do it, we'll find somebody who will and we'll pay them. So we have people desperate for money and that's what they end up having to do.
No question about that. And I think that whoever told you that you're as sadistic as the corporation that you're working for, they were spot on. Um, it reminds me of my time as a news reporter. And journalists will get knocked from time to time if you roll up on a crime scene or an unfortunate uh, murder. Uh, you'll see journalists, they may be laughing and cutting up and carrying on. And it's not because they're happy about what's going on. What, Unless you're a journalist, what you don't realize really is that this is a defense mechanism. This is a callus that you have to form so that you can kind of desensitize yourself as best as possible to the trauma that you're witnessing. Because when you are surrounded by that day in and day out, you have to, your body just automatically puts up this shield. You have to just for self-preservation. And that's also a big part of the reason why I wanted to get out of that profession was just because every day that death, that destruction, man, it does take an enormous toll on you psychologically. So what you're saying here um, about these workers makes just a ton of sense to me. And I'm, I'm really happy that you have that in your book. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the resources that come with this. And one of the talks that I saw you give, I believe it was at Google, you mentioned that if everybody ate the standard American diet, there is no way that we have enough resources here on earth to support that. How much more land, how much more resources, how many more resources would we need if everybody in the world was eating the typical standard American diet? Yeah, that's a great question, you know, because uh, <clears throat> the problem is that in the United States, we eat more meat and dairy per person than virtually any other country in the world. And we have a, you know, a relatively large uh, population, and we also... Uh, are the example in many ways. We have McDonald's and Burger King and Kentucky Fried Chicken, all these chains going all over the world, as we see when we go uh, to uh, China and India, as I've been many times lecturing. And so the reason for this, um, uh, this huge amount of resources is that the animal agriculture industry takes enormous amounts of land. According to scientists who have studied this, the, the estimate is somewhere around, it would take at least three or four more Earths to feed our Earth if everyone on this planet ate like Americans eat. If we all, if everyone ate as much meat dairy and eggs as we do, uh, it, it was completely unsustainable. Uh, we'd have to cut down all the rainforests. I mean, we're already doing that. We're attacking them, we're, we're overfishing the oceans. And uh, we happen to live in a very abundant place here. I mean, the United States of America had enormous rich soils and we lived in an RV for 17 years traveling around the United States. And I can say going to all 50 states you know, many times that uh, most of the land in the United States has been converted into these uh, killing fields, really. They're mat vast acreage of, of corn and soy and alfalfa and other genetically engineered grains that are just fed to animals who are confined away in these stinking sheds where you never see them but they pollute enormously. They, they convert all this into saturated fat and cholesterol, as I said, but also into huge amounts of sewage, to nitrous oxide, to methane. All of these are really toxic uh, gases and toxic products that are then go back into, into the water and into the earth again. Uh, there's over 10,000 different drugs and hormones that are used on these animals. Many of them are very toxic. That goes back into the water and into the soil goes into the food, goes into our bodies, makes us sick. So it's really um, a way of recycling and intensifying toxic chemicals that go into the feed of these animals, into the agriculture that grows the food that these animals are eating, that goes into the flesh and secretions of these animals, that, which we then eat, which we then feed to our children. We see uh, chronic diseases you know, skyrocketing uh, and so forth. And this is all due really to the concentration of toxic chemicals as well as the naturally occurring toxins in these foods like IGF-1 growth hormone and the, and the saturated fat and cholesterol and, and all the other things that we know about. So uh, it's very important, I think, to just understand this basic uh, truth that when we feed huge amounts of healthy plants, which could be you know, health-giving plants to animals who then convert that very wastefully and we lose so much of the goodness and we turn, it, turn it into toxins and then we eat that, that it's not efficient 
but it's also not in our best interest. Why are we doing that? That's the big question I think to ask. Why do we do that? And that's the reason I wrote the World Peace Diet was to dive into that question. And I realized that the reason we do it is because we're just following orders. The only reason anyone eats animal foods is because we're following orders that were given to us, injected into us really without our permission from a very young age. And very often uh, by very well-meaning, loving people, my own mother, my father, my doctor, my teacher, my minister, everyone in my life, my friends and neighbors and relatives were all eating animal foods. And so they taught me to do it too. And it's a, a learning that we get from infancy. So it's very difficult for most people to question this because uh, it resonates at a very deep level with our identity and with our relationships and with being loved and with our family and so forth. But it's very important to realize that it's not in our best interest and that we as an individual now have the capacity and I think really in many ways the underlying obligation to question the food narrative in our society that is so damaging to not only the animals but to ourselves and to the environment as well. Let's look at that last question, but the inverse of it. And let's say that people are suddenly becoming more aware of animal agriculture and what it is that they're putting into their body. So we know that you would need three to four more earths uh, if uh, everybody were to eat the standard American diet. But then flipping that around, what would happen if everybody began to eat a plant-based diet, a vegan diet? What then would that do for the resources that we have available here? And more uh, because it's April and we're looking at Earth Day and everybody taking a, a good hard look at the environment, what would the ramifications then be as far as the environmental impact? What kind of healing could we see here in that regard? You know, I really love that question. Thanks so much, Chuck, for asking that, because that is a very optimistic and beautiful vision that you open up to, because essentially when we, when we actually contemplate what would happen if people move from a uh, typical way of eating now to a plant-based way of eating, according to uh, the, the available research and even the very conservative, uh, like, like the, the uh, National Academy of Sciences, for example, they estimate that it's about between 12 and 15 times as much land to feed someone eating a standard Western diet as someone eating an organic plant-based diet. So that's not just twice as much or three times as much. That's 12 times as much. So <laughs> the good news is that as we move to a plant-based way of eating and living, we dramatically reduce the amount of land and water and petroleum and other uh, destruction that we're causing by our, by our food. And so when we look at people on a large scale moving to a plant-based way of eating, we see this beautiful reversal where... Uh, rainforests can come back again. They don't have to be cut down as we're doing now at over an acre per second. Uh, and uh, o the oceans can begin to heal. Uh, aquifers can begin to recharge again. The climate can uh, begin to restabilize. Uh, our, not only will our own health be much better, but psychologically we'll feel so much better about ourselves because we're living in alignment with our values. Uh, we, there's enough food to feed everyone easily. So the driving force behind you know, at the very deep level of inequality and injustice in our world will disappear. I mean, imagining a vegan world is imagining a completely different world. You can't, it's, it would change everything at such a fundamental level, not only just on the, the outer level, like we're talking about with uh, the abundance of this earth, the beauty and abundance of this earth. That's one of the things I think that's so important to understand. We have this, this idea that somehow we've been plagued uh, with an earth that's not abundant. There's just not enough to feed everybody. And that's absolutely not true. It's like Gandhi said, there's enough for everyone's need. There'll never be enough for everyone's greed. So by moving to a plant-based way of eating, we dramatically shrink our environmental footprint. And as if everyone did that, we would see that we live on such a beautiful, such an abundant earth. We could actually allow rainforests to return, forests to return, prairies to return, uh, habitat to return, the massive uh, loss of species that we're experiencing right now. We're in the middle of the largest mass extinction of species. Biologists say we're losing about 200 species of plants and animals every day. That's caused by animal agriculture and the destruction of habitat, primarily in oceans and forests and rainforests. That could all stop. And we'd, so we would see this tremendous celebration 
of life breaking out on this earth with uh, the realization that we live on an abundant planet, wildlife could thrive, there'd be plenty of us for us to eat and plenty of habitat for animals to celebrate their lives. So this whole idea that it's either us or them, either we, ha you know, we humans have to dominate this earth uh, or, or, or the animals will take over. You know, that's a completely false dichotomy. We can live together in harmony. That's our true nature. It's just questioning the official narrative about food is the underlying problem. It's not that we're bad people, we're a destructive species. It's nothing like that. It's just realizing that we've inherited an obsolete food system. 10,000 years ago, for some reason, people thought we need to imprison sheep and goats and cows together. And maybe they did in Iraq. 10,000 years ago, but today it's completely counterproductive and each one of us can make a choice that will reverberate through the whole web of relations in a positive direction. You talked about optimism and I like yours as well. There are a lot of people uh, in this world who don't necessarily share that optimism. And when you talk about the environment, they will throw up their hands and say, eh, it's already too late to do anything about it, so why even bother? What is your message to that individual as far as how much we can still turn the clock back as far as healing the, the planet, which we all inhabit? Yeah, that's a good question because a lot, you know, a lot of, I can understand that a lot of people look at the situation with the environment and see the terrible destruction that we're doing and think it's too late. However, you know, I, you know, there are scientists that argue that point. And in, in any event, I think the, uh, the main thing is to stay positive and do the best we can right now, because uh, there are tremendous healing forces that are available to us as human beings in our own body. We know that we know people, I know people who have been, the doctors have thrown up their hands and say, you're terminal, you're going to die. And there's nothing we can do about it. And those people are still alive. <laughs> they were able to connect with resources within themselves that uh, help them to heal. And the same thing is true, I think, of our society. We think our society is in a really difficult situation now. We can also heal as a social level, the environmental level, psychological, physical level. And for the earth, the earth has tremendous capacities. I think we, uh, we don't really know what they are. So I think uh, as long as we're alive, the most important thing is every day, wake up in the morning and just think, great, so grateful that I have another day to do the best I can to be a force for healing, a force for being a solution rather than merely being part of the problem. Each one of us can live our life each day that we get. Every day is an amazing gift. And to do our best that day to be a positive role model, to be an example, and also um, to make an effort to understand ever more deeply what's really going on here and to live our lives in alignment with that understanding. I love that message too, because it's so important that everybody hear that and, and how important that positive outlook is. And even if you're the most macho individual in the world and you watch nothing but sports or you play sports, you're a professional athlete, macho, 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 it's still okay to give yourself permission to have that positive mental outlook. It is so critical. And uh, I, I think that that the positivity and the optimism is actually a great place to start when you're talking about making changes with yourself that then can have a ripple effect on others and get things going. You talk about that interconnectivity. Well, you can connect that good just as well as that bad has become so pervasive through uh, within our society as well. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's this whole idea of contagion, you know, versus going through everything. And one of the things that's most contagious is fear. You know, as soon as you set fear going, then people get, you know, everybody gets more and more afraid. And then we get afraid of, of each other. We get afraid of these invisible microbes are going to attack us and all this. And I think, you know, the, it's really important, I think, at least for me as an individual, do the best I can to be contagious in the opposite direction, you know that anyone who gets too close to me is going to just burst out in radiant health. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're just going to feel so great, you know, because, you know, to send love to people, to send love to situations, to send uh, compassion to people that are maybe uh, angry with us because everyone, all of us have been wounded. We've all been raised in a society where from the time of little kids, we've been forced in many ways to eat foods that aren't healthy, to work in jobs that really aren't that satisfying. And so all of us, have been wounded. So the idea is to, to make it into a positive thing to say, okay, I'll do the best I can 
to awaken out of the delusion of my society and also to heal the wounds and in that way be a force that can help bring a, a better outcome. And, and the great thing is that whatever we put out comes back. So ultimately the, the way to uh, a, hell, a positive future is to sow seeds now that are positive. Our actions, our thoughts, our feelings, our interactions, one of the most important things to be healthy because people want to know, like, how can I really be healthy? Because health is really the foundation of happiness in many ways. It's hard to be happy if our body has no energy and we're in pain all the time, right? I mean, a healthy body is really important. So, you know, there's, there's certain keys to health and some of them are food, which we've talked about, uh, but relationships is, is really important. It's, um, one, I think one of the driving forces behind a lot of illness, even if we're eating a very healthy diet, if we are in relationships with our, our, with our friends and family and other people that are stressful or, or anxious or uh, toxic in some way, that's going to really harm our physical body. So to take responsibility for the quality of our relationships, to be a loving, giving person uh, and cultivate a sense of, of love for other people we, and, and to see beyond the surface. We tend to just see the, the surface, the, the skin color or the attitude, but look beyond that and see the being behind the eyes and to send, have a sense of love and compassion for them. And when we do that, I think we just send, we create and we send a message to our own selves that we are worthy of respect also and that our life is valuable when we see that in others. So I think the fundamental thing is to do have a spiritual path of some kind that connects with the dimension of life beyond just the temporary personality that we're always defending and trying to protect, to connect with the infinite eternal life that is our true nature and see that in other human beings, see that in animals, see that in, around us in the earth. And we begin to realize we're part of something beautiful that is far greater and that we are here in, in a very real sense to be uh, an expression of that in a positive, creative way to bring more beauty and harmony and love and kindness and peace into the world by cultivating uh, an open mind and questioning narratives that cause fear and violence in our society. And here's kind of the cool thing about what it is that you're describing there is if somebody's listening to this right now or watching this and they're saying, wow, you know, you can tell that he spent some time on that hippie commune, man, like that, that stuck with him and really helped to shape his life. No, it's, it's a lot simpler than that. Here's what it boils down to. It's kind of, to me, the way I interpret this is the law of attraction, right? You talk about the people who you want to be connected to. These are the people who are positive who bring joy to your life, who put joy out into the world. You want to be friends with that person. You don't want to build a relationship with somebody who's negative all the time and complaining and angry and violent. That doesn't make you feel very good. We're drawn naturally as human beings mm -hmm. to people who are happy and are putting that positive message out there. So what you're saying here to me, again, going back to that macho person, you know, it just seems to make a whole heck of a lot of sense, regardless of who you are in, the, in life. Right. Yeah, that's a very good point. You know, there's this has been well understood in, in uh, spiritual traditions all over the world. There's something underlying everything. It's called right association. Uh, to, you know, we, we become really like whoever we're hanging out with. So you very often find that very angry people very often end up you know, being attracted to other angry people. They get really angry together. You know, <laughs> and, you know there's this sort of a, attraction, you know, association. So it's a good idea, I think, to just be conscious of this and be the kind of person that we would like to have uh, positive, loving, creative people associating with by being that ourselves. And we find that we can build community. That's why community is so important uh, in any tradition, uh, spiritual tradition or just in life itself. We, our whole meaning in many ways and our happiness in many ways does come from our relationships and the communities that we're building and creating. So it's important, I think, now more than ever, that we take responsibility as individuals to help create communities of kindness and love by working together to do that. And I think that's really what you're doing through, through this uh, program and what PCRM is doing is creating a community, online communities and, and connections of communities that can then spread out into the society and, and be a, a healing power in the world. 
We're trying. Everybody's welcome to get on board. That's for daggone sure. Um, we have a lot of people as we wind down here, a lot of people who uh, watch the show who are fans of nutrition. Um, and so I want to, I want to end with this. We were talking, um, about the divvying of resources here on earth, where here in America, we have everything we could possibly ever want and more. And then in other parts of the world, there are people who don't, you know, have a pot or two pennies to rub together and they are starving. In one of your talks, what stuck with me perhaps more than anything was how you made the connection that. Food is making both of those individuals sick. You have the wealthiest of the wealthy who are eating until they quite literally get sick. And then also you have those who don't have anything to eat, who are starving. And because they don't have those nutrients, they too are sick. And so then you talk about connectivity. You've got two people at opposite ends of the spectrum who are bound, who are connected, unfortunately, in this case, in sickness. Right. Yeah. Thank you for making that great connection because when we eat animal foods, we're de deliberately causing, uh, maybe not, maybe not consciously, but it's definitely uh, people who live in less industrialized nations. Uh, they just find themselves unable to compete for grain, for food. We can, we can bid up the price of grain on the world market and feed it to our cows and pigs and chickens and factory farm fishes. And they get plenty to eat and they get fat and we eat them but we've driven up the price of grain on the world market too high for people in less industrialized nations and they just can't afford it. They're forced off the land very often by policies of the World Bank and the IMF and other policies into cities. Uh, they can't grow their own food anymore. Now the, now the land is being used to grow grain, to feed to uh, cows and pigs and chickens for meat and dairy and eggs that are, that are shipped to Europe and to the United States and other wealthy economies. And so this whole system basically causes uh, disease of malnourishment in, in many people and causes diseases of, of a, an ironic type of malnourishment where we're eating huge amounts of fat <laughs> and all the toxins that concentrate in these foods and cholesterol and, and so forth. And we get all the diseases of excess, the diseases of the kings, diabetes, obesity, and liver disease and kidney disease and cancer and heart disease and strokes and so forth. The wealthy suffer ter terribly. And then, and then the, and the, actually the largest market for pharmaceutical drugs is for people with uh, psychological disease of some kind. So exactly what we, we inflict on these animals who are eating, uh, very often we're inflicting on them uh, the psychological trauma of, of depression and anxiety and chronic pain and insomnia and so forth. And we find, again, the pharmaceutical industry making billions of dollars uh, on people who are suffering from depression and anxiety and chronic pain and insomnia and so forth. So as we sow, we reap. The idea underlying all of this uh, is to, whatever we most want for ourselves, to give that to others. If we, if we want to be free, then to free others. If we want to be loved and healthy, then let others be loved and be healthy and encourage that. And that's why going vegan really is not really going vegan. It's just being kind or being loving. It's being a human being just coming back home. It's nothing to be proud of. It's just simply uh, looking out of eyes that see beings when we see beings and treating them as we would like to be treated ourselves. It's basically the golden rule. And uh, so as you say, as Earth Day is arriving here to realize that it's important really every, for every one of us to make an effort to understand these ideas, to bring our lives into harmony with them, and to live a life of loving kindness, questioning the official narratives in our society that promote violence and fear, and being a radiating beacon ourselves of what we would like to see in the world of kindness and love, especially for those who uh, are less uh, strong, you know, especially for the vulnerable, animals and, and anyone who's weak uh, comparatively. I think if we can um, show compassion and support them, then we create a better world for all of us. The book is called The World Peace Diet, and you are on a mission to make sure that it reaches every part of the world. How many languages is it available in now? Yeah, I think it's available in about 17 or 18. We've got a few new ones coming out soon in Portuguese and I think in uh, Urdu and Hindi. But it's, yeah, it's been published and translated into quite a few languages and it's been very gratifying. It's, it's always done by volunteers. 
We just want to have it done, you know, available in their language you know, for people, and then we find publisher too. So that is fantastic. It's a universal yeah. I love it. I love it so much. I highly encourage everybody to go ahead and pick up a copy. You can find a link to do that right now in the show description or in the episode notes. Dr. Will Tuttle, thank you so very much for your time, my friend. This has been very enlightening. Thank you, Chuck. Great work. Thank you, everyone. If you feel like you've raised your health IQ by a couple of points, go ahead and subscribe to this channel and leave a nice comment below. And to hear the entire interview, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your shows from and subscribe to the exam room by the Physicians Committee. And please leave a five-star rating.